It's time for Real Ag Radio on Rural Radio Channel 147 on Sirius XM. Real Ag Radio and realagriculture.com is your home for insight and analysis of the issues that are impacting your farm business. Let's get real and get connected with Real Ag Radio. Welcome to Real Ag Radio here on Rural Radio 147, Sirius XM. Sean Haney, your host here on this Friday edition of the show. Thanks so much for making Real Ag Radio and Rural Radio 147 a big part of your workday. Big shout out to everybody else listening out there on the Real Ag Radio podcast. And uh, big thanks to Lindsay Smith for filling in yesterday on the Farmer Rapid Fire. It was really great to hear from farmers across the country in the Farmer Rapid Fire brought to you by Pioneer Seeds Canada. And I uh, got to meet a lot of you and talk to a lot of you uh, this week when I was down at Ag in Motion in Saskatoon as well. And uh, as we've been chatting about variable crop conditions from, you know, two, like two mile blocks, can you can see big differences who got the rain and who didn't. Uh, it's very, very clear. And the grasshopper damage, very substantial in, in some parts of that southwestern area of Saskatchewan, even into uh, Alberta as well. And then as I was coming home into Alberta, you know, you get to that Tabor area, you start to hit some of those irrigation districts. The, <laughs> it's just a different life when you've got that, uh, that irrigation. It's a whole different set of problems, but it, uh, yeah, it definitely uh, makes a big difference in a year like this. We've also got a beef market update today. Uh, also, Lindsay Smith and Megan Murdoch, uh, Megan Murdoch of HK Strategy be here for the Real Ag Issues panel and Ann Wasco for the beef market update. Speaking of Ann Wasco, we'll get to her when we come back. You're listening to Real Ag Radio, Rural Radio 147, Sirius XM. Infuse some energy into your next corporate event, customer meeting, or conference with Real Ag Radio, Canada's national agriculture radio show. Create a unique experience at your next event with host Sean Haney, broadcasting Real Ag Radio live on Sirius XM, featuring exciting guests, captivating interviews, and the latest news from the agriculture community. Contact advertising at realagriculture.com or call 587-787-1795 to book your on-location with Real Ag Radio today. I am your host today, Lindsay Smith. And now we have a product spotlight. I've got with me Michelle Gemmel. She's the National Market Sense Leader with Cargill. Okay, tell me about Market Sense. What is this product? Yeah, so Market Sense is a subscription-based service that we offer from Cargill. It's really focused on helping our farm clients make confident green marketing decisions. It involves a team of advisors who come to your farm. We would then provide market insights and strategies throughout the year to help you manage risk and maximize opportunity. What we've found too is over the last two decades, we have a proven formula for success that matches the farmer's unique individual situation with our marketing insights and our portfolio of specialized grain contracts. So for those who might be interested in Cargill's Market Sense program, where can they go? CargillAg.ca slash Market Sense. Or you can visit one of our locations nearby to you and ask to speak to one of our advisors. It's now time for the Beef Market Update with Ann Wasco, the Gateway Livestock Exchange. Ann, how are you doing? I'm doing great, Sean. Thank you. Okay. Well, we've got uh, a lot of chat about here. Give us the price update. What, what's, what's happening when it comes to prices right now, both uh, north and south of the border? Well, on the fat cattle market, it really feels like that dog day of summer has has hit. Uh, no trade yet in the south. I expect we'll see something later today, but nothing to tell you right now. In the north, just a wee bit of trade, two ninety one delivered um, on the dress side. Um, that will that is steady, but um, you know we'll we'll wait and see again if more trade comes in in the north, and I think there will later today. So we'll see if if we can keep the market uh, steady to me, maybe even a touch higher in some spots, or if they're thinking they might get. Get done. The cutout, that choice cutout we talk about, lost four dollars this week. Not a big surprise. That's on trend, uh, so that puts it at three hundred two fifty last night. And again, most of that ground was lost in middle meats. Again, pretty typical for for a July wholesale market. Mm-hmm. So that's that's kind of the south. Um, bringing it back here to Western Canada. 
The market was lower, not a pile of trade. Cattle feeders are feeling pretty current, but we did the, the stuff that did market was 395 to 403 delivered. That's one to six lower than last week. Um, but I think if you are feeling, like I say, current, they're feeling good about where they're at in terms of um, um, marketing rates. Uh, weights are down from year ago. So, you know, it's not like um, f- people are feeling they're behind uh, in this in this lower trading market. So we'll we'll see how things go. But again, pretty typical for summer. So that's uh, that's kind of how prices end up for the week. Yeah. How how is all this blistering heat being felt in the southwestern U.S.? There's a lot of cattle in in some of those parts. How how is that impacting the the the, the market or the flow of cattle? What what's happening? At this point in time, I, there, I, there really hasn't been anything significant. Uh, you know, I think you know, lot, yards use a lot of uh, um, technologies to, you know, try to keep cattle as, as cool and as comfortable as they can and in terms of uh, nutrition and all the rest of it. So um, at this point in time, I don't, I wouldn't suggest there's been anything um, significantly challenging these kinds of conditions. You know, obviously we don't put a pile of gain on if you're in, especially, especially in those really, really hot areas, but at the same time, we've got on the other side of the coin the consumer that uh, that is not going to be consuming and eating the same way either. And again, that's what we often find in these really hot spells that you know you do get consumption backing off uh, in those in those areas for sure. Okay, we got some reports to talk about as well. Uh, what are we expecting uh, for the <clears throat> U.S. cattle on feed, and and also we got the the mid year inventory report to chat about as well. Yeah, a couple reports coming out later today. Um, so these are the expectations um, and kind of what's in the market, if you will. So the July 1 cattle on feed in the U.S. is expected to be down 2%. June placements were called down 2% as well. And June marketing is down 5%. So again, seeing those smaller kills take place through June um, in the U.S. As, as like what we saw up here. So that trend of smaller cattle on feed numbers continues like we've seen all year long. On that mid-year inventory report, so in Jan- January and then again in July, we have our kind of our, our twice a year where <clears throat> the governments count the cattle. And so this is the July report. So the total number, this is the guesses for later today, down 2% for total cattle numbers. Beef cows also down 2%. Those beef replacement heifers, that number we watch to see what we think might be going on in terms of uh, growth or liquidation, down 3%. And the calf crop down 2%. So I guess in a nutshell, Sean, if that's how it comes off, certainly um, liquidation continues in the first half of this year. Uh, Again, not a big surprise. We continue to hear about lots of dry areas still uh, persisting. Um, But I guess the question then we'll be watching for the second half of this year is, can we stabilize? I think that's a, that's a word we need to use going forward for a wee bit here is stabilize uh, cattle numbers. Uh, I, I'm not expecting to see growth. Um, so it's going to be, does the industry continue to liquidate or do we find some stability south of the border in the second half of the year? So we'll watch for that. Yeah. And is there anything different happening north of the border? Not really, is there? Not really. Now, uh, last week, Canfax released the um, Alberta Saskatchewan cattle on feed uh, numbers for July 1st. They were down 8%. So that's, again, a trend we've been seeing. The one thing that did pop out of that report here in Western Canada is June placements were up. And not a big surprise when you think about how much we've talked about drought in Alberta. And so certainly cattle being pulled off grass early. I think that continues here in July as we watch these markets. And I think if we continue like this, especially with the kind of conditions where the heat that we're talking about coming up this next week in Western Canada, you know, we're going to start to, I think a, a safe call is start to see an early calf run um, by later this summer as well, coming out of those droughted regions. One of the things that I, I kind of look to the, when you, you see these bigger numbers coming, the internet feeder cells, so the, the team and the DLMSs of, of Western Canada, those volumes are up 58% from last year. So certainly producers are using internet cells. There's more cattle being placed on them because that's a certainly a, a convenient way to sell in the summertime. And we saw the same kind of thing happen in the drought of 2021 but um, those volumes really didn't pick up on the internet until we got well into July and August. So this one's starting early, which I think is just another way to tell and show what these conditions are doing out in Western Canada, especially, like I say, in Alberta for 
for these auction volumes. Yeah, we kind of talked all week here on Real Ag Radio about some of the you know the the variable variable conditions for crops. That that's also the case for for grass conditions too. The, this heat and uh, kind of the lack of moisture that we've seen in in a good part of the say a province like Saskatchewan. Uh, now there has been some places that have won that weather lottery, but a, a lot asking for some some rain. Um, we're going to need some fall moisture here for from a grass perspective. Oh, absolutely. I mean, this is just, and again, like I say, with the heat this coming this week, I mean, anything that was kind of hanging on all of a sudden that, that becomes pretty, pretty much out the window. So concerning for sure that even in areas that felt like they started off pretty good, um, because there hasn't been much moisture in the past month, that's changing quickly too. So yeah, that's, it's a tough deal. Yeah. I think, I think of that. I know you're a big Coolio fan. I remember that he did that song where it was like slide, slide, slippity slide. That, that feels like the grass <laughs> conditions have gone down. Okay. okay. Yeah. Oh, fair enough. I wasn't thinking of that one, but yeah. Okay. I, I, I love when I can make you speechless. It's <laughs> You're right. It, my husband will agree. It doesn't happen very often. <laughs> uh, hey, and, and to wrap up, just to circle back here from a demand perspective, you mentioned it. When when we do kind of get past Father's Day into July, you know, the July 1st, July 4th, we're in the dog days of summer. When it's this hot, you know, whether it's cattle or it's people, sort of back out off on the appetite uh, because it is so hot. Mm-hmm. That is it, this seasonally. This is where we do see a bit of a slide in 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 beef demand, right? Yeah, for sure. I mean, we came through the the key demand um, time frame through this spring and right into June, like you say, in super shape. I mean, those those um, the selling of beef for that time frame was superb. We know in the second half of this year, supplies continue to tighten. So there is that kind of matching of we've got less supplies to sell as we go through this phase of the cattle cycle anyways. Um, so that's one thing. And then the other thing is once we get kind of past that Labor Day and we get back into cool temperatures get back into school and and schedules and those kinds of things we do tend to see especially sometimes uh it changes in ter- terms of what types of meat but more of the end cuts your uh, your uh, front and and uh hip cuts will will kind of take off in there and then as we get closer to thanksgiving then we start to see a pickup in those middle meats again so all of this is very seasonal very typical and it looks like 2023 is on track for that trend yeah, it's going to be a busy, busy, expensive fall run. And uh, we'll see what how uh, all that shakes out. Hey, Ann, thanks so much for joining us here. Have yourself a great weekend, and we'll chat with you in a couple of weeks. Okay, thanks, Ron. You too. When we come back on Real Ag Radio, we'll get to the Real Ag Issues panel and talk about the big issues of the week right after this. Advanced canola trait technology is here. And it's soon to be the talk of the town. Optimum Glide delivers excellent yield potential and agronomic trait performance. Improved crop safety. Enhanced weed control. And a wider window of application. You're going to want to see this. Learn more at OptimumGlide.ca. As you head out into the field this season, The Corn School's got you covered. Everything from tillage discussions, weed control info, field trial results, yield strategies, and more. The Corn School on realagriculture.com has the information and advice you need to help you succeed. Brought to you by Pride Seeds and BASF. Corn School episodes are available at cornschool.com, from realagriculture.com, or as a podcast from your favorite streaming service. Download the latest episode today. Hi, I'm Bernard Tobin, host of the Soybean School on realagriculture.com. Throughout the year, on the Soybean School, we'll bring you timely agronomic video content from planting to harvest, from the latest agronomic research to the latest in production technology. Check out our massive video library on YouTube, realagriculture.com, or download the audio podcast versions wherever you get your podcasts. The Soybean School is brought to you by Pride Seeds, BASF, and Syngenta Canada. Welcome back to Real Ag Radio. It's now time for the Real Ag Issues panel. I'm in trouble here because I, I was warned during the commercial break that uh, the panel's going to gang up on me. 
And uh, I want the audience to feel very sorry for me because uh, this could be a bit of a challenge. Hard, hard to keep this group in check without Kelvin here. Uh, joining us is Lindsay Smith with Real Agriculture, of course, out of Ottawa, Ontario, or Kinburn, we should say. Lindsay, how are you? I am doing well. And yes, technically Kinburn, but it is within Ottawa city limits. So there you go. Yeah, farming inside the city limits. That's got a there's there's challenges I can only imagine. But we, we, hey, farming inside the city limits and your internet is still so, so crappy. What gives? <laughs> oh, I would. You know what? It's a mystery we have yet to solve. So uh. that's a good one. Um, but now it's it's slightly better, but it is not the promised uh, speed that we were supposed to be at by now. So we'll see how it goes. The next Mission Impossible movie that sorting out that problem need tom cruise on it i wonder what stunts he could do in trying to solve that problem can i have anybody but tom cruise because i would okay, choose so someone else he has he has like he's a bit different um mm. unique mm -hmm. we're i think we're supposed to say in today's world uh mm -hmm. but he boy the stunts like the behind the scenes of him doing that bike jump in that movie it's yeah. It's him, first of all. And he's like, I think that's pretty, like I, the one video I watched, it was like him saying, uh, I think it, you know, that was good. Let's do it again as I jump off a cliff on my motorbike. Yeah, no, thank you. I know he is a bit, it, it's pretty wild what well, he does in general. But then also, I don't know how old he is officially, but like, is 61. he a vampire? I know. Is he a vampire? I'm pretty sure he might be. <laughs> well, that's, <laughs> that is up for debate. Uh, also joining us is Megan Murdoch, HK Strategies out of Toronto, who I'm always very jealous of because she can pretty much walk to a Blue Jays home game, which is uh, quite fantastic for her. Uh, Megan, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm doing well, but it's a bit of a sad day. I mean, not only do we not have Kelvin here, which always makes these conversations much more interesting, <laughs> Um, but the Blue Jays aren't in Toronto today. They're in mm. Seattle. Which is basically a home game. Yeah. <laughs> I've been watching Jays baseball, you guys. I don't think they're doing very well. Well, hold on. Well, so you watched what the last couple games? Take like, that back. Yeah. They, <laughs> They, 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 bit of a str quiet bats versus San Diego, but uh, you know they swept the D backs, who are a bit of a slide. And then uh, you know after the Blue Jays swept the D backs, the D backs went into Atlanta and took two or three. It's it just it's full of inconsistency. That's that's the issue. Mm. But they you know are right sorry. there in the wild card hunt. <laughs> How's Ottawa's baseball team doing? You know what? They are doing great. Oh right, you they don't we don't have one. Yeah. That's Jeez. Right. <laughs> So they're batting a thousand. <laughs> so uh, what's interesting here, I, I, you know, Lindsay, you know that I, I'm just, I spend every waking mo I, I, every day I wake up and say, is today the day that ESPN calls? They, they're they going to need That's somebody. Right. And uh, yeah. it, it, eventually it's going to happen, maybe. Um, no, I doubt mm -hmm. it. But uh, so this week I did Jeff Samet's show, Canada Talks on uh, 167 here on Sirius XM. And I, I, he, he lets me come on the show once a month. We talk about agriculture issues. But what I like now is he carves out in our 15 minute segment, he carves out time at the end of every appearance to talk about the Blue Jays baseball, which is just, it, uh, yeah, I love it. You what love I loved man. this week, Sean, was you having your son on to yes. talk about baseball. Wasn't I mean, that, I love that. Wasn't that, that was pretty cool. Neat. Yeah, yeah, it it was really cool, and he did he did really really well. He he had a lot yeah. of fun with it. He had a big smile on his face. Of course, it wasn't video; it was radio, but huge smile on his face. And uh, what well, was really cool? Okay, so speaking of that, so yeah, we had Calum. We were at the Lethbridge Bulls game with the, in in vigor hybrid canola last week. Oh, you heard it here last Friday. And uh, so I'm at uh, Egg in Motion this week, and I run into Keith Fournier. He farms in Lone Rock, Saskatchewan. And he's like, you know, I was at a Sylvan Lake goals game with my family and I, I saw this uh, second baseman making all these plays. I didn't put two and two together until I heard your show last week that that was actually your kid. So, right, because no uh, one would have anticipated that your children yes. would be that talented at sports. <laughs> they got their mom's athleticism, I think, is what happened. <laughs> Probably. Okay, but yeah. you know what my favorite part was, though? Because they, they did do great. I, I really appreciated when Caitlin was like, uh, yeah. Hi, Dad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was pretty great. He asked me before, he's like, am I supposed to call you Dad? Of course you are. <laughs> <laughs> so 
sir. What else would you call me? (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That was pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. And some farm businesses do that where they, they don't say mom or dad. They'll, they'll say like, you know, Hey, you know, Keith, I'll have to talk to Keith about that, but Keith is dad. Uh, I've always wondered. We we never did that. I did that with my brother-in-law who was a teacher at my high school. Oh, really? (laughs) Yeah. Because I couldn't first name him in front of other students. Right. That's right. You'd have to call him Mr. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, now all this has been great. What's not great (laughs) is Saskatchewan crop conditions. They're, they're, they're sliding like a, now uh, you, you'll pre- you haven't heard, I'm not sure if you heard Ann Wasco earlier here on the show and I, I dropped a Coolio reference, which I, I know yeah. that uh, she may or may, I, I doubt she has on her playlist, mm-hmm. but uh, when he says slide, slide, slippity slide, and that kind of feels sort of the way we're going with the, the heat, the thermometers being turned up where, you know, 35, hundred degrees Fahrenheit this week. And things are not looking great, Linz. No, and, you know, in talking to you on the Farmer Abba Fire yesterday, I spoke to a couple Ontario farmers. Things look okay to very good, depending on where you are. Uh, kind of poorly in some areas, but overall, pretty good condition. Uh, and then, yeah, talking to both Ambrose in eastern Saskatchewan and even John Gelly out in Westlock, just there's there's potential that if rain continues to show up on time to sort of have an okay crop for some of these areas but there are plenty of areas that it's already too late it it wouldn't even matter and even some of the rain that did show up was already too late so um i I will say i completely agree you know when you can take the drive as opposed to fly you really do get a sense of just how widespread some of this poor crop is and um the the photos i i feel like don't even do it justice just how poorly uh, some crops are and then the grasshoppers have got what was left in some areas so just year over year of just incredibly difficult conditions. And it's, it's a tough one. Yeah. You know, when you get into the bush and you, you, you're fishing, you, the horse flies are larger. They're like, Mm. you know what I mean? That, that's what we do with Mm -hmm. grasshoppers and some of the, uh, like when grass, as I was driving yesterday, uh, out, out, out of Saskatoon towards Rosetown as the grasshoppers hit the Jeep, and the Jeep has a pretty, you know, vertical windshield. Not a lot of grazes o- off of a, a Jeep windshield, but it was like thud, <laughs> like mm. thud, thud, thud Gross. as the grass. It, yeah, it was uh, they, quite quite the splash they leave on that uh, on that front windshield for sure. But you know, in, in motion this week, Megan. Um, you know, farmers are in pretty good spirits, even considering that, and. Uh, you know, the weather sort of cooperated besides Tuesday. There was a lot of people out to look at some of the, the new things. I, I know you heard our discussion with, with, with John Gormley. Did you pull anything out of that? Yeah, well, I mean, it was great um, to, to hear you on John's show. I mean, he's just such a, you know, stalwart in the Western radio um, history. Um, so that was kind of a cool thing to see you on that. Um, no, it was great to really hear that Egg Emotion was um, such a, a highlight event. It really feels like things are fully returned, you know, post pandemic. Oh, yeah. um, everything is just so, uh, you know, kind of back excitement. People are really happy to be together, um, gathering again, looking at, you know, all the new newest technology out there. So I think, um, just that overall positivity really came through. Ran into tons of fans mm-hmm. of realagriculture.com and people that listen to the to Real Ag Radio through through the year. That that was really cool. I really appreciate when people do that and say hello and you know share some of their stories and some of their experiences that they're going through in in you know in in the year. And uh, there are some good spots. Like, I don't want to sound really negative. Like, I ran into Jesse Meyer, who's up in the piece. He's been on the farm rapid fire quite a bit. And uh, he, he says he's getting like an inch to an inch and a half a week. It's absolutely perfect. And he, Jesse has a smile on all the time. But he had a smile from ear to ear. And it was, uh, you could tell crops are pretty good. So there, there are some spots, Lindsay, where things are, 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 are decent. It's just so variable across the, the, really the whole prairie region. 
Yeah, and certainly where Jesse is, let's hope that uh, Mother Nature turns off the tap at harvest because certainly they've had some issues with uh, yeah. things look okay. There is a crop, you get into harvest, and the tap just doesn't turn off. So uh, it does seem, you know, pretty difficult to try and navigate some of these conditions. But um, I, I will say um, we're kind of dealing with something similar. Things look really good here in the Ottawa Valley, but uh, we are definitely trying to make hay has been probably our biggest challenge. And certainly we've had reports and I've passed by some fields where the hay is it's pretty much going straight back into the field there's nothing left so we just can't seem to catch a break on on a couple dry days in a row it just rains every single day and I don't want to complain because I know that you know there's so many areas that would love it but I can't share it so in the meantime it makes it pretty challenging to make hay so, yeah well yeah. and then and then there's the other side of it too like the southwestern U.S. Arizona mm-hmm getting like, what are we like week or day 23 of 110 degrees plus? Yeah. It's like 40 plus degrees Celsius every day. Yeah. Like 44 or something like that. <laughs> I know, but it's a desert. Shouldn't we be okay? Yeah. With that? <laughs> you would expect it to be that way. Well, there is some eh, not this hot. This is break. This consecutive days is kind of, this is breaking some, uh, yeah. some heat records. But. Lindsay did say it earlier in terms of the West, the Western drought right now. I mean, year over year is what we're talking about. It's been yeah. three or four years. Like at what point, like, do, do we consider what we're doing um, and whether, you know, we can respond reactively with payment programs, um, yeah. but, you know, how are we actually working to either adapt or prevent um, this in the future? And I think, you know, government's thinking about prevention and perhaps we need to, think about adaption. Well, mm-hmm. you know, I ran into, uh, uh, Alana cook. I had a, had a beer with her on uh, Wednesday and I brought up the Palliser triangle and she looks at me and she says, you and my husband, Jerry always bring it. <laughs> and you know, I, I said this, that, you know, Palliser had some comments about the triangle and we didn't listen. There you go. Man, it just feels like it right now. That is uh, that is really for sure. Okay, let's take a break. We got a bunch of issues. We got an FPT meeting. We've got uh, also this port worker strike it, up and down. What's happening? Is there a deal? Not a deal? And also some really really staggering numbers when it comes to the St. Lawrence Seaway, and just shows you how important some of the, this trade infrastructure is to not only trade, but the overall economy. You're listening to Real Ag Radio, Sean Haney, Lindsay Smith, Megan Murdoch, and we'll be right back right after this. If you're involved in the agriculture industry, it's important to stay informed on all the latest issues affecting your business. At realagriculture.com, we offer fast, reliable news, information, and insights to help you keep on top of all of the latest in Canadian agriculture. Visit realagriculture.com and sign up for our free daily newsletter covering everything from news, agronomy, animal agriculture, and much more. Visit realagriculture.com forward slash subscribe today. Whether you're seeding, harvesting, or anything in between, the Wheat School on realagriculture.com has you covered. Timely agronomic information from industry experts available online anytime. Give your wheat crop a good start and a great finish with the Wheat School on realagriculture.com. Brought to you by CNM Seeds, Syngenta Canada, and the Alberta Wheat and Barley Commission. Welcome back to the Real Ag Issues panel. Sean Haney and Lindsay Smith of Real Agriculture, as well as Megan Murdoch of H&K Strategies out of Toronto, the home of our, as soon as I said our, Toronto Blue Jays. <laughs> We're playing better. Uh, yeah, when I tell you all about uh, Granubor from U.S. Borax, ask for it by name. Go to borax.com. Okay, let's dig in here. Port worker strike. Uh, Lindsay, I'm extremely confused. On again, off again. Apparently, we're going to have maybe another vote here that's going to be taken to the union. We got some illegal job action that happened that wasn't given uh, the proper 72 hours notice. Uh, a lot happening here, and a lot of people are just sort of saying, government, back to work legislation. Let's go. Right. So I, I wish I could provide you with, you know, 
absolute clarity at this moment in time. But who knows? It might have changed and we just didn't see it. So yes, that's correct. So they had a deal. We had there was there was coverage of this the port strikes over. Everybody went back to work. Uh then that deal fell through. They uh, started immediate job action. However, that was quickly rescinded because they were told that was illegal. They had to give 72 hour strike notice. So the port workers did. Um and then now it sounds like so then they had to go back to work while they waited for the 72 hours. Now it sounds like there's a deal. Uh we don't know yet. So sort of back and forth, but it really does, I think everyone just sort of said, okay, whoa, whoa, whoa. Um, we we know how costly this has been. We know how important this port is. Why are we going back and forth here? Why are we creating all this uncertainty? Every day that this happens, that there is there is a strike or there there isn't necessarily everything moving as it should, is incredibly costly, but also prolongs how long it's going to take to get everything back up to snuff. And, and we have, I think, all perhaps some of us unwillingly have learned a lot about supply chains in the last couple of years. And we know that when a port shuts down or doesn't have employees, the economic toll isn't just immediate, it is prolonged and every day adds days upon days upon days after. Um, And so we are learning not just how important that port is and whether or not the government will intervene, which we're still waiting to hear, um, but also how important some of our other ports are, which Mm. is pretty cool. Yeah, there was a study that was actually just released this morning. It was a binational uh, report or research that was done by by Canadians and Americans. And Megan, some of the numbers are staggering on the importance of the St. Lawrence Seaway. Yes, I mean, there's a lot, um, a lot in the report that's interesting. And yeah, if we think about it as just one of our critical ports, um, to Lindsay's point, the impact that the the strike is having on the West Coast just comes very clear to us all. But in terms of the St. Lawrence region, I mean, about 230,000 jobs are supported by it. Um, and they say that the, the region, um, you know, being the industrial and agriculture heartland that it is for both the U.S. and Canada, it contributes a combined GDP of more than six trillion U.S. dollars. And to put that into context, you know, it's hard to imagine what six trillion is. But if that was a country, it would be the third largest economy in the world, which I thought was um, pretty staggering when you put it like that. Yeah, and for just the Canadian side alone, it is twelve point eight billion dollars in taxes. Like it's that's that's crazy. A, that's crazy. Now, yeah. okay, so we we know, and and like I said, not just that's not just important for trade and exporters, but it's just the overall economy is is, mm-hmm. is it's critical. So, Megan, yeah. what, getting back to BC the BC poor worker situation for a second. Do you think the government is going to do back to work legislation? Well, what has stopped them from doing it already? Like this isn't something that's new. It's, you know, been underway for many weeks at this point. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. How long has this been going on? I think this is three weeks. I think now. Yeah. Uh, Like what is holding them up? I mean, if this was well, the previous government, it would have been it would have been within days. Okay, I mean, well, is, it, is the answer not votes? It, it, they're, we, we, we're going to have an election in twelve to eighteen months. They're they're trying to show they're trying they're trying to be objective. I, I like that's just like I think at one hundred thousand feet, yes, but I think they're concerned about the, the perception that the union will have and whether or not this liberal government supports union, you know. Yeah. The unions. You're right, because when you think about maybe some of the action that was taken under the previous government, you you need to think about who it's impacting and who is it in the face of every day. And so I think about airlines, um, you know, those kinds of strikes that would have happened and that would have impacted, you know, Canadians, consumers writ large. The impact of this perhaps is a little bit more hidden. I was talking to someone last night here in Toronto um, who has been in um, the tourism industry most of her career, owning, you know, tourist shops 
um, around Canada and Ottawa and Toronto. And she was, you know, thinking about the port impact on just delivery of items here. And it's been such a few hard years for a small business owner like that, that this is just having a massive impact um, and driving people into retirement, like enough's enough, right? Because they're just not getting, they're not getting their deliveries right now. And so their yep. shelves are empty and they can't sell anything. Um, yeah. well, but I feel like the impact of the port strike to your question on votes is perhaps a little bit more complicated and mm-hmm. not as obvious to the average voter, um, which may be making this less of a political concern for the current government. Well, then they should give that. But if that's the case, they should get to work and make get the legislation done like that. Whoa, whoa, whoa. It's July. They're at the cottage. There's parades, <laughs> things like that to go to. So okay. there's, there's beach time. I mean, I think Megan brings up a really good point though, is that which voter are they worried about? Right. So are they worried about unionized uh, staff and, you know, the, the right to strike for unions? Are they worried about BC voters or are they worried about, the voters of exactly that, the shopkeepers and the business owners who are trying to make a go of it and who have already navigated some significant, you know, downturns because of COVID and supply chain issues. And now we've got a a made in Canada supply chain issue, which voter is potentially the louder or the one that they're actually targeting. So uh, uh, on that list, Lindsay, right? Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> Put the agriculture yeah. industry on that list. Do you think yeah. this government uh, is feeling a lot of pressure from the agriculture industry to do something, or do you think it would, you know, shift their their decision on, you know, calling all members of parliament back to the house back. to have an yeah. emergency debate yes. on yes. legislation? Well, I mean, and our our pork sector for for sure and our beef sector has been asking for oh, well, i have no doubt you know, they're putting pressure on the government exactly but but, but i wonder if the government doing anything yeah yeah sure. it's is making the political calculation yeah. to your point against which voters they want to um stand behind in this debate it, well yeah. what we need is minister ing who is a part of one of her 16 responsibilities trade is in that list needs to walk down the hall and talk to Mr. O'Regan and talk to Mr. Sheep Champagne and say, get this done. <laughs> like, th- this is huge. As, as the representative of trade in the country, the minister responsible for trade, this is extremely negatively impacting her, her, her ministry's ability to, to get things done. Like, and we got a crop harvest coming, so a huge concern about pulse shipments. So you you mentioned pork and beef, Lindsay. That that leaves in mm-hmm. in refrigerated reefers. Like this is a big, big, big problem. And so you can talk about you know trade deals and market access, but if you can't get it out of the bloody country, it doesn't matter. Who cares? It's just well, uh, the, the impact of being an unreliable source huge. of product. Yeah. Hey, Lindsay, we had a press re- or sorry, a press conference earlier today about the FTP meeting that happened uh, this week out in the Maritimes. This didn't get a lot of discussion this week, not a r- lot of contentious issues. I know that uh, Alberta Minister uh, RJ Seekerson, um, he when I talked to him at the Stampede, he he felt that BRM was a big part of the things they wanted to bring up. But uh, what what was said in the press conference? Right. So it was a relatively short one uh, compared to, you know, past years where they were trying to hammer out some big deals. This was maybe perhaps more low key. Uh, By press conference time earlier today, uh, several of the provincial ministers had had already left. Um, But the biggest two announcements that were highlighted was that they did um, come to an agreement on simplifying the application process and payout process of agri-stability. So those applying will be given an option to either use cash accounting or accrual accounting. Uh, We don't have full details on that yet, but that's uh, what was put forward. And then the maritime provinces are going to see a livestock price protection uh, program based off the Western model that we have. So not national, but Eastern. uh, So the the maritime provinces... um, getting together to do that. What what perhaps was most interesting is in the question period, uh, we did ask about 
Uh, there were questions about whether or not the agri recovery decisions for BC, for Alberta, for Saskatchewan, if any of those had been uh, discussed and agreed to, and they were not. They were seen as separate from this, I suppose, um, but that those things are still in the works. And there was mention, and this is perhaps perhaps the most frank we'll get the uh, federal Ag- agriculture minister, Marie Claude Bibeau, to say, but on the sustainable agriculture strategy, she did admit that there were differing points of view on how we get to a sustainable agriculture strategy. Really? Yes, I, I thought that was very frank of her. Um, however, when pressed for details, uh, she essentially just you know said that there are many different regions and all have a different idea of what yep. a sustainable strategy looks like, which is true, but I would have loved to have sat in on that conversation. I Obviously. would love to be a fly on the wall where somebody, <laughs> where some bureaucrat <laughs> says, please explain to me again why we invited 25 groups into this room, because this was inevitable. And mm-hmm. I, you know, I'm, not, I'm not criticizing the fact they have so many stakeholders involved, because they should. But yeah, not a shocker. Like, no. Who's surprised? And if, if you're going to spend all your time talking to one or two groups that align on this issue with you, like maybe, maybe sh- there is some surprise that other groups feel differently. I, I don't know. Megan, what are your thoughts? I think we should look back in the real egg. Uh, records and replay uh, the show where we had this exact conversation, (laughs) uh, predicted this exact outcome. Um, I just think that would fill a whole segment for you, Sean. And, uh, you know, the same would be true today, um, Mm -hmm. exactly as you've outlined, right? If you go too wide, it's going to be, you know, and we've seen it across industries where they try to do this, it's too watered down. It doesn't mean anything. It has to be watered down because it can't possibly apply to the geographical, um, you know, differences that we have, not to mention sectors uh, that we have. Um, and then what use is that really at the end of the day? Mm-hmm. Like, it's not practical. The real I egg practical. crystal ball. Hello, <laughs> please sit down, look into my Hello. eyes, flip over this card. I just feel like card. we should listen to Real Ag more often, and we you can know, steer them away from some of these, um, okay. you know, decisions. Hello, we are Real <laughs> Agriculture, and we're here to help. Uh, we got to take a break. <laughs> we'll be right back with more. You're listening to Real Ag Radio and the Issues Panel. we got Megan Murdoch of HK Strategies, Lindsay Smith, and Sean Haney from Real Agriculture. And we'll be right back right after this. Peter Johnson at WheatPeteRealAgriculture.com. I'm the host of The Word, and I love doing The Word. I love the questions. I love the challenges. I love having to apply agronomics to all over the globe and areas outside of my normal jurisdiction. Also, I love the feedback the most where growers challenge me, tell me about their plot results, help me to learn. The Word, absolutely the best part of my day. Canola is more than just a pretty face in the prairie landscape. It's a big business, both here and around the world, that requires you to be informed and up-to-date on everything it takes to grow a successful crop. The Canola School on realagriculture.com has an expert library of video resources covering markets, agronomy, and more to help you grow a healthy and profitable canola crop. Visit canolaschool.com today. Brought to you by BASF Canada and Invigor Hybrid Canola. Hey, coming up here in August, down on the Stampede Grounds in Calgary, Alberta. You know, if you didn't get enough Calgary Stampede, well, let me tell you, August uh, 15th through the 17th is the Canadian Beef Industry Conference. It's happening at the BMO Centre. Join the industry, proud, innovative, and loyal. We are beef in Canada. Build your network through speakers, trade shows, entertainment, and when I, you know, speakers, entertainment, just to talk about that for a second, Real Egg Radio. We'll be broadcasting from the event. Looking forward to it. We're doing it from the stage. It's a live recording of the show. Looking really forward to it. It's going to be great fun. Appreciate uh, the organizers and team over there at CBIC for inviting us. You can find out more by going to CanadianBeefIndustryConference.com for more details and to register today. Okay, um, there was a story out, gang. Oh, by the way, we're talking to Lindsay Smith of Real Agriculture and Megan Murdoch of HK Strategies out of Toronto. Uh, there was a story about 10 days ago. Now, not much has happened since this story was put out. So I think at this point, 
there's a lot of rumor here, but there's some there's a little smoke to the fire, so to speak. Discussion that Bear Crop or Bear Cor- Bear Parent or Bear Corporate is looking at shedding the Bear Crop Science division. Now, uh, do they sell it off in pieces, the crop protection, the seed, or is this something that's just spun out as a separate entity? There's a lot of unknowns. This all ties, Lindsay, to the liability around glyphosate. This this issue just does not want to seem to go away. Well, and not unsurprisingly, I suppose. I mean, I think, you know, when when we first heard that Monsanto was going to be sold, uh, regardless who was going to buy it, it was a bit of a, holy smokes, what happens with the liability that goes with it and can you manage it? Um, I'm going to guess that Bayer figured they could and and could still make their money um, off of the acquisition. But I think, honestly, the not just existing uh, lawsuits, et cetera, but the legacy of it, for for who knows how long, I think is just a black cloud over that entire portfolio. And so I guess the question is, you know, yes, it's speculation that Bayer Crop Science will be, you know, spun off or or sold off in pieces or something. But my question would be, but where does the liability with the glyphosate Roundup Monsanto legacy go? And how do you sell anything attached to that? Because if Bayer couldn't make a go of it, how does anybody else? That's why I I think that's why I think being spun off as a separate entity is is probably the most likely. And and the also the other the other force here is the Competition Bureau, and and who you know if Corteva just and we're totally like this is just scenario brainstorming here. If Corteva said, yeah, speculation. If if Corteva said, hey, we'll buy it. All of a sudden, it's like, uh, like that's consolidation. Wow. Like, you know, yeah. you know what I mean? So th- yep. there's some headwinds there. There's some headwinds there too. You know, Megan, it's interesting. And you live in the city. Uh, I live in a in a city, but smaller, um, <laughs> much smaller. And I know when I go out to spray some of the weeds in the rock garden along the the street, uh, like I don't like the weeds growing between the asphalt and the concrete on the sidewalk. I'll go out there with my little uh, spray bottle. And I get some pretty big stink eye from my neighbor across the uh, the road that's um, rather granola. He does not think very kindly when I do that. Uh, it, it, even though that is a very, very weak, weak formulation, uh, people have their mind made up on this one uh, for or against when it comes to glyphosate. Yeah, totally. And thankfully here in Toronto, we don't need to worry about too many weeds between the concrete because there's oftentimes more concrete than there is green. Um, But yeah, I thought this um, kind of at least watering down of this rumor uh, was quite entertaining. Of course, it's speculation until the ink is dry. Otherwise, it's, you know, selective disclosure of a a pending deal, which isn't appropriate for a variety of reasons. But I think Lindsay's right on. Who who wants this thing? Um, You know, it's going to be a loser, uh, it has to be like f- five year turnaround from when they bought it in the first place. Um, but analysts who have reviewed the deal say that the component parts valued separately would have a total equity value of 96 billion euros, which in context is almost double the group's current market capitalism capitalization. So wow. The money, the dollars make sense, apparently, Um, and certainly from a reputational uh, future risk perspective, because you don't know how big this litigation gets and how long it goes and how wide it spreads. Um, It it makes sense to to offload it, right? Get back to the core strategy of of what they do and part ways with, you know, potentially a a poor decision. Well, you know, when... when at that time, like you know, M and A activity tends to come in in bunches, and it, you know, at that period, it was Bear Monsanto, it was the combination of Dow Pioneer and Dupont, and it was the you know, Chem China buying Syngenta. And I remember, you know, back to the real like crystal ball. I can remember us talking about, you know, probability is one of these three 
doesn't really work out like they want. And you know, everybody uses like the Time Warner AOL merger going back to oh, what would that be? The late, uh, it'd be the early two thousands um, as like you know one of the most epic going bad mergers in in corporate history. Um, you know, it's interesting. I, I, I'm not going to say this is the worst of the three. There's a lot of good things that have happened at, 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 at Bear. Um, you know, Kim China has had difficulty with the Syngenta IPO. That's, that's definitely been a challenge. It's been a long integration in, in creating Corteva. These, these things don't happen just as sort of, they don't go, they, success just doesn't happen because you put a couple entities together. But, uh, you know, you look at Corteva, it's a standalone business, ag-focused. I, I think there's probably some advantages for it being just bare crop science and not having to be somewhat saddled by some of the priorities of, of a parent uh, drug company. So um, there's, there's probably some for and against. Anyway, it's, uh, we'll see if and that comes to anything. Are they able to keep the IP that they would have captured? I mean, for any future mm. yeah. you know, benefit? Uh-uh. I think that'd be a big part of it for sure. I think so. So, you know, they've taken it essentially for what it was worth and they're going to offload it and, and maybe do something in the future differently. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Uh, Lindsay, what are you, what are you following next week? Because if you can believe it, we're in the last week of July. Oh my gosh. Can I, so I can't actually believe that. Um, and I don't know if it's like the older I get, the faster the summers go, or if it's just been that this one has been particularly fast. Um, I do know certainly between, and I'm hoping sort of August slows down in that in, in our line of work, and it, it perhaps mirrors some of you out there, uh, July is just events and field days and field days and events. And then August, everything sort of quiets down a little bit. Well, everybody sort of tries to get some downtime in, enjoy the summer weather, and then, you know, before we ramp up for harvest. So um, certainly, you know, looking to do maybe that lull ahead because, um, to be entirely honest, all of our Real Ag team has been everywhere, yourself included, Sean, and gathering up videos and profiles and agronomy stuff and we have a mountain of stuff to go through so definitely that will be on my plate next week because of course in august some of our team's going to try and take some holidays um and monday of course i host the agronomists we're going to talk about sclerotinia and some other disease control uh issues in canola and then tuesday i'm on the show i'm really enjoying my tuesdays Mm. i hope everyone else is too i I, I am too i appreciate it (laughs) <laughs> it gives you some time to do other things. Yeah. Hey, well, and we and we launched <laughs> real egg shops. So we did. you got to really people got to check that out. We did a, a the episode one is and this is filmed in MTV Cribs kind of style. It's a lot of fun. Bit of a tour through a shop and Jordan Kolk of Kolk Farms out in Picture Beat, Alberta did a great job in episode one. So please check that out at realagriculture dot com or on our YouTube channel. Megan, what do you have on tap for next week? Well, I'll be checking out that uh, that new show because it sounds awesome. I'd love to see some of the shops around the country. I had the the um, benefit and honor to see a few of them while I worked with the agriculture minister. But it'd be awesome to see what's what's out there and what's uh, what innovations are uh, are keeping uh, folks busy in their shops. It's over, a, it's... Uh, I think you, you were talking about what they might have done over um, winter or something too at one point when you were pitching the show. So yeah, that'll be cool. Indoor pickleball court. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. I, I know another yeah. farmer too in Southern Alberta that put a pickleball court in their shop. So this is this is not a one oh one off thing. I uh, appreciate Princess Auto for being the sponsor of that new series. Hey Lindsay, have yourself a great weekend. You as well. You too, Megan. Yeah, you guys as well. Hopefully Kelvin comes back soon and you know picks up the slack. <laughs> He's he, the guy's not very. He's been messaging me all week, so he, he took it <laughs> off. But uh, he's still right there. He's like oh, right on my shoulder. If you have any feedback, you can send me an email s haney at realagriculture dot com. You can also call the Real Ag feedback line eight five five seven seven six six one four seven. Thanks so much, everybody, for getting real and getting connected with Real Ag Radio. Have yourselves a great weekend, and we'll chat again on Monday. Cheers, everybody. Mm-hmm.